We were so love-struck, we wanted to hide away. We found a cottage on this peninsula of land that went three miles out into the middle of a huge lake. Uh, the walls of this cottage, they were, they were a foot thick and uh, there was ivy and leaded glass at the windows. It was, it was so dark at night. The sky was lit up by a billion stars. We were literally miles from uh, everywhere. We were surrounded by water. <laughs> you were always smiling at me then. Our first child was born. Um, we called her Grace. I planted a magnolia tree for her in the front garden. Our lives, well, they were perfect. It, our lives just glittered with love and we thought that that happiness, that contentment, that golden dream would, would just carry on and go on forever. Um, you were expecting Freddie, our second child. <laughs> um, I had a routine checkup at the dentist um, and she nicked my gum. Ah! Uh, and then that night, without a word of warning, that night I sat down on the sofa and I started... Well, I sat down on the sofa and I started to die. It was sepsis. Uh, it came on lightning fast. I was shivering. I was cold. I was in extreme pain like never, ever before. I was short of breath. My heart was beating very fast. I was sleepy, very, very confused. And my hands and my feet became freezing cold. I was numb. What was happening? This wasn't in the plan. You were supposed to be driving to the tiny cottage hospital to take our daughter Grace to meet her new baby brother. Instead, I, I was confronted with doctors pushing forms at me, asking me questions. What had you eaten? Were you always this swollen? Were you always this colour? And then more sinister, what kind of chap is Mr Ray? Does he have family? Every time, accompanied by a pen, shoved across the desk a mile wide. A nurse, sad, holding my hand, and a doctor, inscrutable, unreadable. So, my birthday, your birthday, Christmas, the millennium, a litany of sad holidays marking the stages of your dismemberment. They took you from me, limb by limb. Yeah. Uh, when I woke up from my sepsis coma after four entire months, I didn't recognise who you were. I didn't even remember you. All the memories of my past life, 35 years of them, had simply vanished. My hands and feet had been amputated. Um, my nose, my cheeks, my, my lips, my chin, even the, the tip of my tongue was gone. I was literally reduced to being half the man that you'd married. I had a, 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 a foot and a half long breathing tube cut into my throat and a catheter wired into my groin and I couldn't even move. But there you were beside my bed in this little hospital side room at Addenbrooke's in Cambridge and you were cradling our newborn son, Freddie. He was born whilst I was in the coma. And 
Wow, you were just smiling at me. You were such a beautiful sight to behold. And so little by little, I, well, I felt like I'd been run over by a thousand trucks, to be honest. Um, the physical pain and the, the sorrow, the confusion, they were so profound I hardly knew what to think, what to say. But you, you reminded me that we still had our daughter, Grace, at home. And, and you said that she was two and a half, and I remembered her, and you said that she still needed her dad. So, well, little by little, bit by bit, day by day in, in the hospital side room, I started to believe that, well, maybe, maybe just possibly a fella could come back from something like this. And so, and, 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 and also that I had even reasons to be cheerful and inspiration enough to work, work really hard like a demon in the, in the rehab gym in the hospital, uh, getting fit and strong. So, yeah, maybe I could wear those prosthetics and maybe I could get back home. You clung in on to life like you weren't done with it yet. And if you were doing it, then I had to do it too. But the cost. Every day, every hour, there was a switch back of hope and disappointment. Then the bargaining began. The more they took, the more we gave. The job, the car, the house even, they're the easy things when the stakes are this high. But perhaps if we gave everything, you'd be allowed to come home. So that's what we said. We gave everything. We had to sell the cottage on the peninsula, the beautiful place that we'd, 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 we'd made our life in, and we had to leave our village home. I remember walking out of there on the last day on my prosthetic legs down the front path towards the garden gate and stealing myself in my head not to turn around, not to look back. We moved in with your mum. Uh, that felt like an ending. Uh, to me, I just, at that point, I didn't know how I could carry on being a husband to you and a father to the two little children if I couldn't work and provide a, a home for you. There were, oh God, yeah, a thousand appointments every week. Um, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, prosthetists, psychologists, all kinds and all comers. And my stumps and my legs and my arms, they were always cut. They were always bleeding. And I sank. I fell into a deep depression. I, uh, I was just wrapped up in my own troubles and I didn't realise or understand how much pressure you were under. We swam under the full weight of the ocean, 50,000 leagues under the sea. We were together, yet separate, living the same events, but experiencing everything so differently. There is, there is no revelation. Change doesn't come like that. There is no road to Damascus moment, but actually what happens is when you do slow, swim, swim this slowly, you have to stare at every single grain of sand. I think I can stop my panicking mind. I can concentrate on a single grain of sand. I can absorb myself in drawing my own hand on the back of a hospital canteen receipt. I can lose myself in the ceremony of tea. Yeah, I, I, I had to put myself back together and find a way to function fast. Otherwise, it was clear to me I was going to lose what I had left. By this point, I'd lost practically all of my self-respect and all of my self-confidence, definitely. But, you know, deep down, 
what I still had was a sense of a sense of this creative man that I wanted to be. I wanted to be a writer, and and a lot of love inside still to keep me going. So, what did I do? What could I do? Well, I went out on my prosthetic legs with my robot arms. Look at this. <laughs> Can you do that? It goes the other way as well, look. I went out and I found a job. It was only part time, it was only on minimum wage, working in a call centre. Uh, but it was crucial, you know. It got me out of the house, back into society, and it got me back earning a little bit. It felt, felt to me like I had to give you a lot of space to be the person that you needed to be, mm -hmm. so that you weren't just my carer. Mm -hmm. um, and so the fact that I was busy at work, well, that was great for both of us. So I just threw myself into that routine, really. I went to work. Um, I learned to drive a car as well with these robot hands. Went to work, answered the calls, came back home. Went to work, answered the calls, came back home. And when I came back home, I tried to be as constructive as I could and tried to, to work out ways of helping around the house. Um, and helping with the children. We were so proud the first day that Tom went back to work. I can remember thinking, this is a glimpse of a future where we're just average. And that's a really huge thing for us. I can, I can remember I took the kids to the local news agent and yeah. they spent all their pocket money on stuff that stuck to their hair and their teeth and their skin. Uh, spent all the money, the £7.54 that you'd earned. £7.54 <laughs> an hour is what I got paid. By the way, I did that job for 13 years. Um, yeah. And... Uh, as I said before, yeah. it kind of saved us. Yeah. But what was happening is I was starting to look after myself. And if you look after yourself, then other people start to benefit as well, and that's the first place. The danger is that when something like this happens, temptation is to become a martyr or a victim. But actually, I think we sort of developed our own form of resilience, and it was not something that you're born with. There's an awful lot of rubbish spoken about that. There are different kinds of resilience that have been hijacked, but real resilience is actually finding in the moment when you most need it, just a little breathing space, just a little thought that you hang on to and you remember it as a point in the future when it's really desperate, when you really need it. You think, I remember when I felt good there, that tiny moment, and you build on it. Doesn't matter how small, as long as you've got it, it will grow. Now, we're nearly two decades on from my medical crisis, and we've put it all back together, mostly. We, um, I'm a professional copywriter. It's my dream job. I love it to bits. Uh, we made a feature film about our story. Let me say that again. We made a feature film, like a, a proper big movie. It's called Starfish. It's been in the cinemas. It's out on DVD. We also wrote a book telling the story from our personal point of view. Uh, we speak in public now to encourage audiences to feel that they too can recover from their setbacks um, and also to spread the word about, res about sepsis. Um, I've used relentless positive thinking to to deal with my situation, combined with, with what I call a huge amount of creative determination. I'm from Essex and I simply will not be beaten. Um, I've let love be my inspiration, love, purely and simply, to endure and sometimes to overcome 
the physical, spiritual and mental pain that I still feel. It doesn't always work, by the way. You can't just will it always through. But generally, I get by. And what do I feel after all this time? Well, it's the simple, natural gratitude of still being here, still being alive. Hey, I'm alive. Still being a husband to this amazing woman, still being a father to two wonderful grown-up kids, and still being able to take these kind of opportunities to speak with you. And really, what, it, what, it, what, is, what is it when we talk about resilience, Nick? It's, it's that spirit of, of, hey, you know, yeah, we've all got problems. I know all of you outside in the audience today, I know you'll have something that's bothering you, um, whether it's, you know, a relationship or a separation or an illness or some other form of suffering. And I know everybody goes through something, but hey, we're grown-ups. We can do it. We can overcome. And if I can do this with these plastic limbs, then you guys can tackle your situations as well and you can get through. There's one other thing I'd like to say before we wrap up. Um, and I haven't really often had the chance to say it in public, but I, I just have to say a sincere and heartfelt thank you to my wife, Nick. Really, literally, thank you for saving me. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Thanks for um, tolerating the intolerable. Uh, no, he's not the man I married, self-evidently, but I think you might agree he's twice the man I married. <laughs>